Whenever you guys are ready, you're ready. Yeah. What are we taking? The most recent one or the first one? What? Sorry. Was it? Is it the IMS? Was he so mad about me? Okay, let's do um That's true. Okay, um my one rule everybody for study sessions with me is that if you're going to just dive into side conversations with your neighbor, then just go do your own study session and that's fine. Um, but if otherwise I just don't want to talk over you because that's why I think you're here. Uh, okay, so going, I'm going to do just a quick overview of units one and two of kind of like what's in there as well as like what main questions you often see related to those topics. And then we can jump, we can do like a unit nine one um, since Melanie requested some of the end units. And then so we have to fit that in in 35 minutes. So, okay, so unit one, um, moles and molar mass, I think. We're all good there, you know how to calculate molar mass. One just helpful hint if you're not doing it already is if it's a multiple choice question that requires you to do molar mass, always round to whole numbers. Um, there's no point keeping decimals on a multiple choice question when you don't have a calculator, okay? Um, the next one is mass spec, which one of these popped up, actually I think in two places on this most recent one. Uh, mass spec graphs are the ones where the y-axis is mass, um, no, not, that's not mass. Y, I said Y axis. The Y axis is mass. The X axis is, oh, I say this backwards again. Yes. One more time. Third time's a charm. This is mass and this is like percent of abundance. Um, and the graphs typically look like just like lines. Like very skinny bar graphs. Um, I'm just doing a study session, but if you just need to like take your quiz, yes. Yes. So the way you read these graphs, or the way these graphs are made, is it's a graph of all of the isotopes of one element only. So keep that in mind. You can technically do mass spec graphs for like whole compounds, which if you watch forensic shows, they always talk about using their mass spectrometer. Um, the most simplest way is though with a single element and then it divides it up into the isotopes. Because the red number on there, remember, is a weighted average of every single oxygen type that can exist. So oxygen can exist with a mass of 14, it can exist as a mass of 15 or a mass of 16, 17, 18. Those are the isotopes of oxygen. The red number up there is the weighted average, meaning the height of the peak plays a big role in where the average will lie. Okay, it's just like how in this class, your grade is weighted towards the test. The test would be the tallest peak. And so it's gonna have the biggest role. Um, so when you need to interpret these graphs, normally the question is like, what element does it represent? You find the tallest peak, Because I can do the one that you just most recently did where like, I don't remember it, was this, and this was like that 90 of peak. So you find the tallest peak, you find the mass, you find that mass on the periodic table. So I find, okay, somewhere around here. Everyone see that? Because 90 is my tallest peak. 
And then to decide between the two, you look at where the other peaks lie in relation to it because they're gonna pull the average in that direction. So in this case, since all my peaks are above 90, my average would get pulled above 90 as well. So hopefully questions on math spec graphs. Once again, they appear every the tall peak is like 90, but it you have so many on the other side that it get all the way up to like 92. Yes, technically it could. Um, what I've always seen though is it um, there's normally multiple choice, mm -hmm. and it's normally you're only debating between two because otherwise you have to do like math. such detailed math to get there. So, but yes, theoretically it could. So if it did have, if you did notice like, oh, it could be any of these three, you'd have to think more about how much it could pull that average over. So yeah, but but maybe just so far that you I've know. never seen it. Yeah, because it's multiple choice, and they're not expecting you to do it. Okay, any other questions about math specs? Um, I don't have a question on math specs, but I uh, was wondering if the next topic would go, over, would go over the relation of equilibrium to pH. Sure. Sure. Okay, other things for unit one. Um, electron configurations is from unit one, and a big thing with electron configuration, I think a lot of you recognize this. Um, I think most of you, I feel, are good at writing a generic electron configuration. So that's 1s2, 2s2, that pattern. Um, but the AP test loves to add a twist to how they're asking it. So a lot of times they love to do like a charge configuration. So they say like, hey, write the electron configuration for Mg2+, plus, um, not just straight up Mg. So if something has a charge, how does that change its configuration? Good, so positive means it removed. If it was negative, then you'd be adding extra. The one catch with the removed is, let me pick a different one. So if it was like chromium, three plus, um, let me just write so it goes, four S two, three D, when you remove electrons because it's positively charged, they always get removed from the valence shell. And valence is the highest number. So this is the ground state. The charge state would be, all right, we're gonna remove three. So these would all get removed. And one of those would get removed. So you almost like remove, sometimes backwards it feels like from how you added. I just always remember the highest numbers are always valence, and you remove from valence shells first. That's the other one that was like on this year's prep, or the most recent practice test we did, where the other word is, instead of a charge configuration, it said the valence configuration, I think was the word they used, which means they only included the two S orbitals, not the S, the S and the P, are your only valence shells. D and F are never valent. Would you take off S first or would you take off P first? P would come before S though. Yeah. So if you were starting to remove. So um questions on configurations. Um, along with configurations, a corresponding thing is the graphs that go with it, which is the PES spectrums. Don't mix them up with these. Um, but that's the one where they look more like this type situation. Um, the x-axis is binding energy. Um, once again, these are called PS, photoelectron spectrum spectrums. Um, and this is the one where the peaks are corresponding to the removal of shredding the shells. So you, the biggest thing is to check the binding energy, because sometimes the scales are weird. But let's say if this over here has the highest binding energy and this is the lowest, what peak or what does this peak correspond to? The 1s orbital. So the highest binding energy is the inner ones. So then you would label, I know I made this totally not right, but so it'd be 1s, then 2s, then 2d, so on and so forth. 
and that doesn't make any sense because the 1s should be the same height as the 2s because the height of it represents how many electrons are in that shell. So this would be 1s2, 2s2, and then since that is, we're going to say hypothetically half the height, 2s, 2p1, so this element would be? Once again, kind of these two graphs are, I would guarantee you're gonna have at least one of them, maybe both, they kind of pop up every so often, but they should be an easy one to get a point for. I had a question, like, since the starting effector are going to be like this, so if you're like comparing, like, that's like with like, the kinetic side? Yeah. Like, do you think that it's a pattern, like, because when you're talking about like, the amount of profile, like, do you have to like, think about it? If you're like comparing trends, is that what yeah. you're saying? Because it's like, because I know you can do like the indicator types, but like, are you supposed to think about that? Like, like yes. If, if it says it's charged, if it doesn't explicitly state that it's charged, yeah, it, like, that it's charged. Like, yeah. then you should take, yeah, take that into consideration okay. as well. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, I guess I'm saying like if you have to research mm -hmm. your own. Yes, so like if you're comparing like size, if something is charged, that's gonna play a role in it because the electrons are gonna decrease or increase the size of it, right? And then same thing, even like ionization energy, that could still play a role. So yeah, yeah, definitely like take it into account. Yeah, would they ever ask you to write out like the entire thing to get there or like using like the brackets of like you know what I'm asking? Like instead of shortcutting it with the brackets, is that what you're saying? Yeah, or like how would they phrase the question if they wanted to, to use like the brackets and like write out the entire electron? Oh, but not like a charge or like thing with shell? Yeah. It would just say write the ground state electron configuration for something. And that's just everything? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But you can always shortcut it. I've never mm -hmm. seen where they care that you start at 1s. Mm -hmm. But that would be, yeah, you're not, you don't have any adaptions if it just says Right, the ground system. Okay. So. Um, my question was just about like the weird exceptions, like when you have like S and P orbitals, they like like mixed together or something. Like hybridization. No, not hybridization. It's like uh, there's like four S one and. It like jumps around. E so you're not expected to know the exceptions. Okay. Like if they so technically, chromium is an exception, and it's not four S two three D. How I wrote it, but they won't. They don't expect you to know them. They could show it to you, and then maybe say like, "Oh, what is the charge of this, or what would its configuration be if it was three plus?" So then you would take what they give you and then do the removal. But no, that's one of the things the AP says is the ones where it is weird, where it goes like four s one three d five and leaves a half empty shell. You don't have to know. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions about configurations? Are you ready yet? Are you ready? I will be in a bit. Okay. 11, right? Is that the one we're taking? The drawing, yeah. the blue structure one? Yes. yes. Are you ready to? Yeah. Same one, right? Yeah. Sorry, hold on, friends. And I'll be um, retaking the most previous one. <laughs> like the one we took two days ago? Yeah, two days ago. Okay, I don't know if there's a retake for that yet. And then, so we may not be able to. trends is the other big thing of unit one, um, of knowing what they are. Um, and the whys can sometimes pop up in FRQs of like, explain why this element is bigger than this one. Um, with the trends, um, 
biggest thing I connect in my head when you're explaining the why is the why's always go back to one of two reasons, and it's either because of the official thing to use is the columbic attraction, which is the fancy way to say positives are attracted to negatives, or distance, which is also in a sense part of columbic attraction. Um, so this is the idea of how the nucleus has an attraction to the electrons. Because it's positive and negative. So the three main trends are we have atomic radius. So what, if we're drawing a diagonal arrow, draw with your finger, what is the trend for atomic radius big to small? So point to the big and then draw a line to the small. Oh. Draw a line. I'm just trying to see. Yeah. You're all drawing lots of lines. Okay, so this is my periodic table. Okay, this is my periodic table. This is my periodic table. These ones are the biggest in size. And these are the smallest. general trend is in that direction. One thing, the big thing is, is every row adds a whole new shell, which definitely makes it bigger. Why though going across, do they get smaller? Stronger columbic attraction, so the nucleus pulls the ring in. Like same number of rings, but a tighter pull so through each ring. Um, we have ionization energy, which is the energy it takes to remove an electron, um, which is completely opposite. Um, one thing that seemed to pop up at least once every test with ionization energy is giving you a table of a series of ionization energies. They love to do that where they say, oh, the first ionization energy is 10. These are made of numbers. The second ionization energy is 20. The third ionization energy is 5,000. <laughs> I wonder where it jumps. Is it in between zero and one? It's very little, right? Um, so the thing with these series is you're looking for the big change. Now keep in mind that the fourth ionization energy would probably be like 6,050. So it's all about where did the biggest change happen though, right? So if the biggest change happened here, what does that tell me about my unknown element? It's going from the edge. Where it's going to a vortex. Good, so it's the point at which you've emptied the valence shell completely. So we would say that this substance has two valence electrons. which tells me it must be in column two. It also tells you that it must typically form a plus two charge. So it's another pattern to remember if you forgot is that the column they're in tells you the most common ion they form, sometimes the only ion they form. But the pattern is plus one, plus two, skip the entire B section, plus three, plus or minus four, and then counts down three, two, one, minus three, minus two, minus one. So, um, that's another one with ionizations if you haven't taught how to solve those problems at how you solve it. Um, the other trend is electronegativity, which is the same trend for ionization, except technically the noble gases get dropped on this trend. Because electronegativity is the force in a bond being pulled, and noble gases don't bond, so they don't pull out electrons. So I didn't finish my word there. Electronegativity. So, um, those are three main trends. Any questions that come to mind about those? Okay, and that's like unit one, pretty much. Um, valence electrons and ionic compounds, so 
knowing those charges and then we'll try to get two back in. That's how atomic radius is measured. Um, is atomic radius, so here's my nucleus. So atomic radius, in a sense, is the distance from the nucleus to the outermost atom. And so when it bonds, that's also going to affect it too, or how close it can get to another thing's nucleus. Is that kind of what you're talking about? Um, unit two is all about, the idea of it is bonding, but it is a little heavy on the covalent side um, of understanding what ionic, covalent, and metallic are. Okay, I'm going to erase all this. Is that okay? okay. So let's just summarize those bonds. Magnitude of charges and then size of how close they can get. There you go. Is that your pencil? Okay. Um, that's mostly it for ionics. I think it went out my head. Lattice energy is the word for that force, so vocabulary. Um, so don't get like so if you see the word that lattice energy is just referring to the strength at which this is held together. Um, so yeah, so it's very similar. It's a delta H value, but that specifically is referencing the force that it holds together. So when it talks about which one would have the greater lattice energy, it goes back to that same pattern of more magnitude, stronger force, closer particles, also stronger magnets. Um, metallic. I don't know if you've even seen it on these. Have you seen?
seen some about alloys on any yes. of these ones? Yes. So it seems to be a common one question on a multiple choice somewhere, um, where we have two different types of alloys. We have substitutional. Well, I can't spell my subs. And I don't remember the other one. Interstitial. Interstitial. I don't know if I can spell that word. You're right. Interstitial. Interstitial. All right. Sounds great to me. Um, what is the difference between an interstitial alloy and a substitutional alloy? Like similar size, and so it like replaces the metal. The substitutional is same size. Oh. And interstitial is smaller in size. I think of inter as in between, and substitute you're substituting just the same size. Um, so. Picture-wise, like a substitutional alloy, so if brown is like my original metal, a substitutional alloy would look like, well, let's not use red and brown, would be like this, where it's a different metal, but it's like the same in size. An interstitial alloy would be something smaller, so it could go in between. Um, Often the benefit of an, or the use of interstitial alloy is to increase strength of the metal because it prevents it from bending by sticking things in between. Um, the benefit of a substitutional alloy is typically to like increase conductivity maybe. Um, if, the, if it doesn't conduct or something like that. But I don't know if that helps with the, most of the time I feel like it's just like pictures and then picking the one. But. I was just going to say, what questions would they ask that would like require that? Like, it's mostly, like, I've seen some where it's, like, it gives you pictures, and it says, like, which one is the interstitial alloy, um, or it gives you, like, elements to pick between. Like, I've seen one where it gave you, um, I think it was a plate of nickel, and then it said, like, which element would be the best substitutional alloy? <laughs> So you'd want to pick something that is very close in size to nickel. So the answer was copper, because copper is going to be very similar in size to nickel. So I really think, honestly, the best thing is just knowing the definitions. Most of the time, you can solve the question after that, because it just is trend of sizing, really. But yeah. Okay. Um, that's what I'm going to think about with metals, really. And then covalence. Um, there's quite a bit of things to know on that. So covalent is when electrons are shared, right? So I share with you, you share with me. Um, that's where Lewis structures comes in. If you're not great at Lewis structures, that could be a great thing to or practice or review um, is drawing a Lewis structure. Because I think there's always at least one on every FRQ. Seems like you have to draw at least one Lewis structure here or there. Um, with Lewis structures, um, knowing the Vesper shapes, slash bond angles, slash hybridization, which once again isn't always there. Like I think of the three practice tests we took, hybridization was on one of the three. Yeah. Shape was two. Shape was on two of them. Bond angles on one of them. Yeah. Was there two times? There's something about turn on one once and something else about Okay. So, but like the name of it, not like saying what the angle is, like degree wise. One of them asked for. I know one did, that's the one, but I can't remember if there's more than that. So, pretty much at this point in time, this wouldn't be a bad thing because it's simple just to review, but it's definitely not something to like. Yes, because it may not be there. Yeah. This, though, yep, is definitely something like I would know how to draw a Lewis structure. Any questions about Lewis structures in particular? Uh, like, what are the exceptions for Lewis structures? Because there's like resonance, right? And then there's also, isn't there like a few other things? Um, the biggest thing with Lewis is like, so you do have resonance, 
Um, resonance is a good one to remember. So resonance, again, is the idea. We'll pick one from this test since it's all in our heads. Um, ozone. Resonance is the idea of a mirror image, but it's the same thing. And so the molecule, molecules like to be symmetrical. Like, once again, we don't know always why they do it, but they just always do it naturally. So when scientists have studied ozone and they measured this bond length, they found that it's longer than a double bond, but it's actually shorter than a single bond, which would imply like a one and a half bond. And that's how both sides are. And so that's why we draw it like this. Once again, I don't even know if this is the best way. Sometimes I think we should change our notation and draw like half bonds, but. So this is the idea of saying, well, the electrons are actually somewhat mobile. In truth, it's so mobile, it looks equal. Um, but that's the idea of a resonance. It's pretty much, if you, can, if you draw your picture and you recognize, oh, it's symmetrical and I could put this here instead, then show that it resonates. Another big thing too, once again, with FRQs, pay close attention to the prompts. Because the prompt on this one said, show all resonance structures. Like a lot of times they'll give it away that it resonates. Or sometimes they'll even say, show one variation of the resonance structure. Like, so that can sometimes help you know, like, oh, this definitely should resonate. So like, I know some people did this wrong and they drew it like this. But if you read the prompt and recognized it has to resonate, maybe you could catch yourself and recognize like, oh wait, it doesn't. Now on that line, Jared, it brings us into the other type of exception of expanded octets, that some elements can go bigger than eight, but some never can. Um, the line is from phosphorus and higher. Honestly, you might also just want to know that like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen can never expand. Chlorine. Yeah, but fluorine's never going to be in the middle anyways. Yeah. yeah, so it's like of a central atom, those are really, anything outside of these can. But if it's one of these, don't give it more than eight. You have to rearrange it some weird way so it doesn't have eight. Okay, I'm not like, how oxygen, if it has six valence electrons, like how does it add up to eight? Like what is the correlation this, there? This, how does this become? Yeah. Is that what you're asking? So yeah, this is definitely an exception thing where, so oxygen comes with six, right? Mm -hmm. So we're gonna backtrack here. So it comes with one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So that's why a lot of people think, oh, double bond on both sides, but it can't do that expanded octet. And that's also kind of where resonance comes in and this idea of electrons are mobile things. So I'd say, all right, so here's six, here's six, there's six, right? This is the best way I can explain it, Abby. And once again, it's because of this. If it wasn't this, double on both sides, that's the answer. But we, what scientists have found is, all right, well, double bonds here, we know it's bonded, because otherwise it wouldn't be O3. So I'm gonna move one of my dots here. The problem is now, Technically, that is over, eight. right? Two, four, six, eight, nine. But then, did I just draw something weird? Mm -hmm. Ooh, odd number. Yeah. But then, like this one, only has two, four, six still, right? So it's kind of like the electrons literally get passed over. <laughs> like it's not just a covalent share. It's like we're just gonna share my excess with. So like this extra electron like gets passed over and that's how you get the structure. Um, yeah. I actually, also has been one of my research projects this year trying to better understand and explain how it happens. Cause it's weird when you look at how many it comes with, right? It comes with six, it comes with six. Like how does this get over there? But pretty much, once again, I would just know if it's one of these three, you can't have more than eight, but everyone needs eight in the end. So how can you move things so everybody has eight without overfilling the middle? That's kind of how I'd get to the final answer, so. But it's definitely an exception to the common pattern, so. Will? Rough boron, 
And Boron is the exception of under, yes, yes where exactly. typically it only forms three bonds and it's satisfied with it. Yes, so it doesn't really ever form octets, it just forms six tets. Would, would, boron, would boron only preferably form two bonds so that it only has one in like each of the three rotational Half-filled shell. It'd have a half-filled shell with one in each of the three, like reverse slots. I don't know that for sure. It seems logical. Because I feel like that would be more stable than. Because typically it is. Like, so yeah, I have to look at what compounds boron is with. But yeah, that's a good observation. So, um, and that's really it for unit two. Is kind of just knowing the three types, molecular views, um, Vesper. Have you even seen any questions with formal charge? Have you, that word come up in any of the? No, no, but it's involved. I think I saw it. Uh, it was one of the ways that you could justify it. Uh, one, oh, you like could justify it using formal charge, or you can justify okay. it. Uh, and there's like a few older ones where they used to like it was an explicit thing, like you had to find it, and I didn't like that because I don't feel like it's. But it is one method for justifying structures of why it must be true. So. Um, if you want to, it's, it's also not on your formula sheet, so I don't know if you want to add that to your list of things to memorize or not, but it's a way where you can check and see the stability of a picture and know, like, if I have two different structures, which one, like, so, like, uh, CO2, if they were to give you this or this, and say which one is the most valid structure for it. Um, formal charge is one way to justify it. I go off of kind of the way Abby thought about it of just like bonding behavior of like, well this oxygen, oh wait, I did too many dots there, thank you. That was better. Um, but oxygen needs to bond twice in order to complete its octet, right? And so like, um, formal charge of the equation is, so formal charge is valence electrons minus lines minus dots. So we'd say, all right, oxygen has six valence electrons minus two lines minus four dots. Its formal charge would be zero in this structure. And that is the goal is to have zero versus in this structure, six minus two three minus two would give this oxygen a plus one formal charge, which is not as, so it's not as stable of a structure. So once again, kind of those things that appears and, and disappears. So, okay, I'm sorry I don't have more time for you guys, but um, any last dying question on the word minus word? Any last good question? Here's Terry. I do have a mini question about logs. I like to call it mini. Yes, what's your mini question about logs? Um, well, how do you, like, understand how to do them? Like, in terms, well, if you're like in pH, okay? Okay. So, like, a log, I, I haven't worked it in there, but we're kind of interested in So, like, are you saying, like, if it's multiple choice and I don't have my calculator to push the button? Yeah. Okay, then you have your calculator, just trust the magic button and push log. Okay. <laughs> um, if you don't have a calculator, and you're doing it, and you recognize you need to take a log of something, so like a perfect example is if they give you a KA, let's say like 2.5 times 10 to the negative 5 is a KA value. And then let's say for whatever reason you want the pKa value, which pKa is a negative log of that, or like same thing like you need to find pH. Without a calculator, you just go to the exponent, and that's going to be close to your answer. And if it's multiple choice, only one of the answers is going to have a because they don't make you be more specific without a calculator. Okay. I guess you could be more specific. This is the high end, so it's going to be between four answers. I guess I should be more specific. So, does that help your mini question? Technically, it's like 
kind of. Or it's um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, guys. Um, look over things this weekend, but I'd also like if there's one thing that's just like really not clicking, I honestly would set it aside at this point. Because three days out, like stressing over one thing isn't going to be worth it versus little things that you just need to keep fresh and remind yourself of. Little mistakes that you don't want to make twice. I review your practice test. That would be a great thing to do these next few days. Um, and then I'll see you all on Sunday.